2019 happened. Uh, it was a year, some movies came out, and uh, some of those films I liked more than others. So here is my year-end uh, list of my favorite movies from 2019. It's obviously an incomplete list. I haven't seen everything. I'm currently in France, and there are some release discrepancies between territories. So for example, uh, Uncut Gems, which is a film that I absolutely want to see, uh, will not be getting a theatrical release here, uh, and will be released on Netflix, I believe, at the beginning of next year. So it's a film that I will integrate more into a 2020 list. I just want to start off by mentioning some, some honorable mentions, films that didn't quite make the top 10, but I felt deserved to be celebrated because I really, really connected with them on a certain level, and uh, there are 10 of them, so I guess you could say that if I had made a top 20, these would be within that. They are being displayed right now. And so uh, here we go, top 10 films of 2019. And number 10 is Ad Astra, directed by James Gray. Ad Astra is an incredibly imperfect film that I also found immensely beautiful and extremely well put together. James Gray is one of my favorite directors. If you've ever seen my 2017 year-end list, The Lost City of Z was very, very high up. Ad Astra is a less complete film, I want to say, in that it's a film where you can really, really feel the studio intervention and the studio notes, and yet somehow it really works. It's Joseph Conrad in space. It's apocalypse now among the stars, and despite any imperfections that it may have, it was a film that I found beautiful from start to finish, and um, again, I really want to celebrate James Gray as a filmmaker. I can't wait to see what he does next. Uh, so yeah, there you have it. At number 10, we're starting off with Ad Astra. Number 9 is from Portugal, and I'm really happy to have a Portuguese film on this list. There are some really, really creative and inventive filmmakers coming from that small little country in the south of Europe. And it is Diamantino by Gabriel Abrantes and Daniel Schmidt. I encourage you guys to watch my review on the film. It's just an absolute blast. It's crazy. It's one of the most singular original pieces of film that I've seen all year. It was one of the best experiences I had in a cinema. I just was smiling ear to ear for an hour and a half. I really, really love it. And this is the kind of film that as somebody with, you know, a small YouTube channel, small following, if even one person uh, goes and sees this film and loves it based on my recommendation that I feel like I have done uh, a wonderful public service. So this is a film that I really want to champion, Diamantino uh, at number nine. At number eight is Zhe Zhang Kei's Ashes Purest White. As with that Astra, this isn't Zhe Zhang Kei's best work, but even a lesser Zhe Zhang Kei work, like a lesser James Gray work, is still an incredible film. And it really dives into a lot of the thematics that, if you're familiar with Zhe Zhang Kei's works, you've already seen a lot of similar elements, a lot of similar themes, a lot of similar visuals, but for someone like me, it really worked because it felt like a summation of his body of work, essentially. I mean, if I were to recommend a Zha Zhan Cave film, I think the first one I would recommend is A Touch of Sin, which I think is his absolute masterpiece. This one is, is so much in line with everything that he's obsessed with, is so much, like I said, a an amalgamation of his cinema that in that sense it really works. It's a beautiful film, it's incredibly shot, it's got some great music cues as always, and it's a Zhe Zhang Kei film, which means it's great. And at number eight is Ash's Purest White. And number seven is, much like Diamantino, an uproariously funny and surreal, strange film. It's Quentin Dupieux's Deer Skin, a beautifully put together 90 minutes, really funny, surreal, great performance by Jean Dujardin. And, you know, it's short enough that it doesn't wear out its welcome. It is a weird little concept that kind of holds together remarkably for that 
duration. It ends in a very just abrupt way because how else do you want to end something like this? And as with all of uh, Dupuis' films, it's sort of a meta commentary on creating cinema. Uh, this one in an even more evident way than the others, but another film that for 90 minutes, I just had a huge grin on my face and was loving my time in the theater at number seven, it's Deer Skin by Quentin Dupieux. Number six is one of the most intense cinematic experiences of 2019, a barrage of images, of sound, something that really I just wasn't expecting. I don't think my body was ready for it, but Dear God, did it love it, and it's Leo Joe's Pelisseri's Jalikatu. It is the Mad Max Fury Road of Kerala, and I've actually tried watching some other films by this director, which really haven't connected with me in the same way. This one was just such a surprise, just such a punch in the gut that I couldn't help but put it on this list. And it has some pretty interesting things to say politically about India right now, especially in regards to mob rules and lynchings. Um, so yeah, Jolly Katu at number six. Number five is a film that will have been on many people's uh, 2018 list, but it actually was released in Canada in January of 2019, or at least in, in Quebec. So I'm going to put it on this list. It is Pavel Pavlikovsky's absolutely gorgeous Cold War. I don't think I've seen a film as formally beautiful as Cold War all year. The black and white photography is sublime. Every shot of this film could be printed out into a still and hung up on the wall. It is that beautiful. The way that Pavlikovsky frames is really singular in that everything is completely off kilter and off balance. Characters will be framed in the bottom right or the bottom left corner of this four by three aspect ratio, leaving a huge amount of negative space, which is not something you associate with that square format. Generally, negative aspect ratio is something that is synonymous with 235 to one and anamorphic shooting. When you shoot in classic academic uh, 1.37 to one, generally it's perfect for like center framing and shooting just beautiful close-ups, which is something that Pavlikovsky really doesn't do. And of course you could write a really interesting piece on the way that Pavlikovsky frames his two main characters. It's an incredible love story across the ages, across the Cold War, across multiple different European countries. It's a profoundly European film and really interesting in that it takes place before the construction of the Berlin Wall where moving from east to west was extremely complicated but it didn't have that physical barrier that we then saw arise in the 1960s. I haven't seen Ida yet, which I hear is Pavlikovsky's true masterpiece. Uh, and if it's anything like Cold War, then I'm really, really looking forward to it. Number five is Cold War. Number four is Marriage Story by Noah Baumbach. Uh, just a very simple tale of two decent people getting a divorce and it turning extremely messy, not because they're bad people and not really even through the fault of the lawyers. It just happens to be a process that is ugly and brings out the worst in people. It's a film that doesn't take sides where everybody is both right and both wrong and it presents a situation where there really isn't such a thing as a win-win. Um, it really is just lose-lose and you kind of have to accept your losses and move on. So at number four is Noah Baumbach's masterpiece, Marriage Story. Number three is a film that like Cold War, I've seen pretty recently and haven't put out uh, a full video review for, and it is Pedro Almodovar's Pain and Glory. Now I actually did record some thoughts that I had on the film earlier this month, but it never made it out into a full video. It was kind of short. And so I've just decided to integrate that review into this video, so here are my uh, original thoughts on the film. Pain and Glory is directed by Pedro Almodovar and it stars Antonio Banderas and Penelope Cruz. Antonio Banderas stars as Salvador Malo, an aging movie director who is an obvious surrogate for Pedro Almodovar himself. The film starts with Malo trying to reunite with the lead actor of his first film, they left on very bad terms 30 years ago, but now he's trying to make amends so that they may 
both present the film together, the restored version of the film together at the Cinematheque. From there, the film is set up so that Mario can reflect on his life and his past work from his childhood in an extremely poor working class environment where his mother is played by Penelope Cruz, to his first sexual desire, his first love, as well as his relationship with his mother. Now, I'm no expert in Almodovar cinema, but from what I have seen, this certainly seems like a summation of his past works, of his aesthetics, and of his past themes. And I find that very interesting, simply because of the fact that I watched this film almost back to back with The Irishman, in which Scorsese does something that's very similar, obviously in a manner that's different and in a way that's less autobiographical. But nonetheless, there are many similarities to be drawn with these older men, these older filmmakers reflecting on their past lives and past themes. Both these films feel extremely melancholic and also filled with regret. It's certainly far more difficult for me to talk about this film in the broader context of Almodovar's filmography because, as I've said, that's not necessarily a filmography that I'm particularly familiar with, certainly not as familiar as someone like, say, Martin Scorsese. It's not a film with a larger historical implication like, say, The Irishman or a socio-political commentary like Parasite. It's just a really touching, simple, beautiful film. It's tender and funny and melancholic, and it touched me in a profound way. The acting is top-notch, needless to say, and there really is something particularly perfect about the casting, considering the long-time collaborations that he's had with both Banderas and Cruz, there is something, like I say, just perfect about Banderas playing essentially uh, an on-screen version of himself and uh, Penelope Cruz playing his mother. So there you have it, just a, a beautiful, beautiful film. At number three, it is Pedro Almodovar's Pain and Glory from Spain. Number two is a Netflix original movie that I was lucky enough to see in theaters, much like 2018's Roma, which was my favorite film of last year. Uh, one of my favorite films of this year was produced by Netflix, released in theaters, and I'm so happy that they gave this amazing filmmaker the opportunity to create uh, a tremendous piece of art. It is Martin Scorsese's The Irishman at number two. You know, I really gave this film a glowing review when it came out, and as time goes on and I just keep thinking about it, it keeps getting better and better, uh, and it's one that I really want to watch again. One that really fits perfectly within Scorsese's body of work and really is just the perfect film at the perfect time in his career where the framing of the film is this old man reflecting back on his life's work. And of course, with all the older, tremendous actors that are at the center of this film and this being the film of an older, illustrious director, those are some thematics that you can really attach yourself to while watching the film. Um, it's a tremendous accomplishment at 3 hours and 20 minutes. It's one of the most exciting films I saw all year, and it really just flew by. It was great to see all those actors once again in a tremendous film. We haven't seen Joe Pesci like this in decades. He steals the show. He's so charismatic and warm and touching, and I just love this film. Number two is The Irishman by Martin Scorsese. And at number one, it's Parasite by Bong Joon-ho. Bong Joon-ho is one of my favorite directors. He's, in my opinion, one of the best directors to have emerged in this century. Parasite is a tremendously crafted work of art that works as well as a literal thriller than it does as a metaphor on class warfare and capitalism. It has been winning every award under the sun and is the most successful Korean film of all time, at least in terms of international sales. And I think that's of course because thematically, of course, some things are extremely specific to Korea, but we all live in the country of capitalism and so it really resonates in many, many other territories, and it's not like I'm gonna say anything revolutionary that you haven't heard before. Everybody loves this movie, and rightly so. I guess the only criticism I could lay on this movie's feet is that it's not even my favorite Bong Joon-ho film, because I think he's such a tremendous director that this is, you know, maybe in his top three, maybe, because he's just a, a master filmmaker, and um, I love that he's getting the recognition that he deserves and I really just can't wait to see what he does next. My favorite film of 2019 is Parasite. 
And so there you have it. That was 2019. That was at least my 2019. My next video will be a recap of the decade. It will be my top 50 films of the decade. And I want to leave myself still a little bit of room to continue to watch some movies. And so I hope you all had a wonderful 2019. I hope 2020 will be even better. And um, just thank you all for watching the video. Thank you all for watching the channel. Uh, I recently hit 700 subs, which is really exciting. Would love for 2020 to make it to 1,000. That would be that would be great. That is my goal for next year. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks again. Thanks very much for watching the video. Until next time, see ya.